if you will, and turn to John chapter 19. And uh, many of you know we have been in John chapter 19 for uh, quite a little while now. And we're going to, Lord willing, we're going to finish it up today. This will be our last installment in this series that we've given to you uh, most of the time on Sunday morning and uh, entitled Behold. And we're going to look at that last time that it's used today. And I hope it's going to be a blessing. Now, I'll tell you this for sure. This is going to be a lot more like a lesson today. This is not going to be as much of a, a preaching sermon as it is going to be a lesson. And, but I believe it's going to be helpful to you, and I believe we're going to apply, be able to apply some good lessons. And so, uh, John chapter 19 in your Bibles, and when you find your place, if you'll stand this morning out of respect for the reading of God's Word, John chapter 19, we're going to read verses 25 through 27. The Bible says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Now we talked about that last week. But look at verse 27. The Bible says, then saith he to the, to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. And that's what I want to talk to you about just for a few minutes today. Behold thy mother. And uh, I apologize. I sound like I'm in a barrel today. And, uh, but anyway, you pray that I'll get out of the barrel real soon. Amen? The only barrel I want to go to is Cracker Barrel. That's the only barrel I want to go to. <laughs> And I'm ready to get out of this one, and I know some of you are as well. And so you may be seated. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to ask God to teach us something this morning. I believe this is going to be a help to you, and let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you for the, again, for uh, letting us be here today. God, thank you for the good congregational singing. Thank you for the great choir specials today. And Lord, thank you for this wonderful song, uh, Lord, that Brother Mike just gave us. We appreciate you using him to bless us in that way. And then thank you for our musicians, Lord. I was just thinking about how blessed we are with musicians at Calvary. And uh, God, we don't want to take that for granted. We thank you and we praise you for that. Now, Lord, we, we love the music. We love the singing. And, uh, but now, Lord, we make our way to what we consider to be one of the most important times, and that's the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Now, we've received teaching through the music, and we're supposed to. But Lord, as we come to this time of preaching, Lord, you told us that you've ordained the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And so I pray now that you'll bless our time, hide us behind the cross. God, I sure ask you to touch us physically today. Lord, please do, do something miraculous there. And uh, God, I have a truth that you've given me that I want to give to your people but I pray that you would, Lord, bless us physically so we'd be able to deliver it, Lord, in the way that we need to. I pray that Jesus will receive praise and glory from it. And Father, we ask all these things in Christ's precious name and for his sake we pray. And all God's people said, amen. We've learned this over the last few weeks in the 19th chapter of John. The word behold is used on five different occasions. By the way, can I just testify a minute and say this? I've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed taking a little time and just getting around the cross. And uh, Brother Brandon preaching, uh, mentioned that message uh, that Brother Pope preached at the youth conference on the cross. I've heard that message. It's one of the most powerful messages that you'll ever hear. And, uh, but I've enjoyed this time that we've been able to just get around the cross for several weeks here in John chapter 19. And uh, we find here that it's used on five different places throughout John chapter 19. And each of those words means, basically it means to know or to be aware. And so each time we find that word behold used, we find a significant lesson being taught. The first time we see it in John chapter 19, verse number four, the Bible says, Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. So number one, behold, I find no fault in him. And we learned there that our Savior was absolutely sinless. He was the perfect Lamb of God that came to take away the sin of the world. I owed a debt I could not pay, but thank God he paid a debt he did not owe. 
The second place we find that is verse number five. The Bible says in verse five, then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate saith unto them, behold the man. When Pilate said, behold the man, it was a form of sarcasm denoting their decimation of Christ's body. Uh, Isaiah said that his visage was so marred more than any man. And so by the time we get to John 19 and verse five, the Lord Jesus Christ is already almost unnoticeable. He's never made it to the cross yet by verse number five. And yet he has been beaten. He has been abused. He has been, uh, his body has been decimated. The, the third place we see that is in verse number 14, John 19, verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour and he saith unto the Jews, behold your king. And we learn there that this was Pilate's attempt to humiliate Jesus so severely uh, in hopes that the Jews would not want to crucify the Savior. And of course, we know that's not the case. They did crucify him. The fourth place is in John 19, verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, Behold thy son. And what a beautiful uh, truth that was, that Jesus Christ is literally at the point of death. He's hanging uh, on the cross, nails in his hands, nails in his feet, having suffered the wrath of God for our sins, and yet the Bible teaches us that he takes the time to care for his mother. And so every one of these lessons are great lessons. But then we come to the last one, and we find that in verse number 27. This is the last time the word is used in John chapter 19. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. At first, when I uh, started studying this out, I thought, Lord, how am I gonna get a message out of this? But then the Holy Spirit began to work and began to, uh, begin to speak. And, uh, and then I began to think, Lord, how am I gonna get all this in in one service? And uh, behold thy mother. In other words, when Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross, uh, looks down at John and says, John, behold thy mother. Again, keep in mind, that word behold means to, to know. I want you to be aware. And so Jesus is saying this to the apostle John. John, I want you to know. I want you to be aware that you have been given responsibility for this woman that I call mother. Now, that's interesting to me. In fact, that's super interesting to me. You say, preacher, why is that so interesting? Well, did you know that Matthew chapter 20, verse 21 documents the fact that John the apostle already had a mother? He had a mother. It's not like he needed another mom. He had a mother. But now he's, he has the care of two, not one, but two different mothers. I'm not preaching on this. But when I, when I saw that, this is what I thought about. The Christian life is not necessarily a life unconven uh, of convenience. Did you know there are times when Jesus may ask you to inconvenience yourself? You see, John already had the care of one mom. Now he has the care of two. And John loved his mom, by the way. But now I think John equally loves the mother of Jesus. And he takes the mother of Jesus into his care and he begins to care of her. This is not convenient for John. Did you know it's not convenient to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're looking for a convenient life, it's not the Christian life. It's a great life. It's the best life you'll ever live. I can promise you that. But it's not necessarily a convenient life. You see, it's never convenient to come to Sunday school. It's not convenient to come back on Sunday night. It's not convenient to be faithful to revival, nor is it convenient to read your Bible faithfully or to spend time in prayer or to go soul winning or to serve the Lord. And I can guarantee you this, that the devil's gonna do everything he can to try to defeat you and, and distract you. You see, it's not convenient, but one of the things we learn here in John chapter 19 is that John is willing to be inconvenienced. Did you notice that? John is a picture of a yielded 
Christian, Lord, this is not convenient what you're asking me to do. I've already got one mother. Now I'm going to have two moms. I'm going to have to care for one. Now I've got to care for this one. And uh, Lord, it's not going to be convenient, but Lord, I'm absolutely willing to do. By the way, if you study that out, you'll find that's exactly what John did. He took her unto him as his very own. And from that day on, he cared for the mother of the Savior. He was totally yielded to the Lord. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you totally yielded to the Lord? I I dare say most Christians are not. And the reason so, or the reason being, it's not convenient. You see, if you really sell out, boy, amen, amen. If you really sell out to Jesus, it's going to take some sacrifice. (laughs) I mean, it's just not easy sneezy and and, uh, you know, a road of ease. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you what, man, for those people that just really come to that place and you say, you know what, Lord, you've got me. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to say, whatever you want me to give, I'm willing to do it, Lord. Uh, I'm all yours. I'm all in 100%. I'm all yours. Most Christians don't ever come to that place in their life. And the reason for that is because it is not convenient. It demands, absolutely demands some sacrifice. But boy, how many know this, that no life is ever born without travail. And so until we get to that place where we're really willing to sacrifice, we're really not going to make a difference for Jesus like we should. And then I thought about this. Actually, when you get down to it, it's really not inconvenient to live for Christ. <laughs> you say, Brother, Brother Steve, you're, you're confusing me. First you say it's inconvenient, now you say it's not inconvenient. I thought about this. It's really not inconvenient. You know what it is? It's reasonable. It's reasonable. Isn't that what our Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You see, it's really reasonable for me to come back on Sunday night. and It's really reasonable for me to come back on Wednesday night. It's really reasonable for me to come to Sunday school and to give a tithe and to give an offering. It's really reasonable for me to be here. Uh, it's really not inconvenient at all. I'm glad to be here. I'm privileged to be here. And you say, well, preacher, why is it not inconvenient? Because, friend, I want to tell you something. He inconvenienced himself for me and paid my penalty on Calvary's tree. He dipped his soul into hell. And had he not done that, listen, you're looking at a guy that would be desperately lost and on his way to hell. And I'm going to tell you, in light of all the Savior has done for me, the least I could do is serve him. Man, wow, wow. But I got a question for you this morning. Man, I'm reading through this, and the Spirit of God is speaking, and I'm thinking, whoa. I never noticed that. By the way, that's the way this book is. It's always fresh. Every time you go back, there's always, if you'll just be faithful to go to this book, it's always fresh bread from heaven. And I'm reading this, and I'm studying this, and we've been studying this chapter for weeks and weeks and weeks, and I've been reading it almost every single day for weeks and weeks and weeks, and I come to this last uh, behold in John chapter 19, and and the Spirit of God begins to speak, and, and here's a question I have for you. Why is Jesus charging John with the responsibility of caring for his mother when it's very clear that Jesus had siblings? Man, I, I read that and I was like, wow. You said, preacher, Jesus had siblings? Absolutely. The Bible's very clear about that. Matthew chapter 13, the Bible tells us specifically that Jesus had four brothers and we know he had sisters. The Bible includes both. We don't know how many sisters he had, but we know he had brothers and we know he had sisters. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, they were half. We know that Jesus was, uh, was God. He was God incarnate. So these brothers and sisters would have been half, if you will. They would have been steps, stepbrothers and stepsisters. But here's my question. If the Lord Jesus Christ had siblings, and he did, what in the world is Jesus doing in trusting his mother to John's care rather than his own brothers and sisters? And I think I found the answer. You said, Pastor, that's a good question. 
Why is it that the Lord did not go to James or Joseph or Judah or Jude and say, fellows, I'm, I'm passing off the scene. Take care of mom. Why was it that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't go to his sisters? You know, sisters, you know, you know uh, daughters and mothers have a thing a lot of times. They have a very unique relationship. Not dad and da- daughters do too. You know what I'm saying. But, but you know, uh, women are just more caring. They are. I think we can agree, agree about that. Have softer heart, more emotional. And, uh, and, and you, you ladies, when, when, uh, uh, when you see uh, uh, another lady have a loved one that passes away, you're, you're more, you are more uh, compassionate and uh, sympathetic. Now, we are too. Fellows are too. But I'm just saying that, that you ladies have a, a, a special God-given knack for that. So here's my question. Why did the Lord Jesus not go to one of his sisters and say, hey, I'm passing off the scene, and mom, uh, Joseph is dead. Uh, that we believe that, that Joseph had already passed away. And so why did he not say to his sisters, now listen, y'all take care of mom and make sure that you minister to her needs and make sure that you, you take care of like women can do and make sure you minister to them. And yet we don't find that happening. We find the Lord Jesus entrusting the care of his own mother, whom he loved extremely. We find him entrusting her care to a man who wasn't even in their family. Why is that? Can I tell you why? Number one, Jesus' siblings were not believers. Are you are, hanging there with me now? I told you it's going to be a little more teachy today. Jesus' siblings were not believers. They grew up, now get this now, they grew up with the Messiah as their brother. <laughs> they lived in the same house. They ate meals around the same table with the Son of God, with the Lamb of God, with the absolute Messiah, and yet they did not believe that Jesus was the Savior. You say, preacher, you got any proof on that? I wouldn't preach it if I didn't have any proof for it. Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn over to John chapter number 7? John chapter 7, and maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I'm hearing this for the very first time. I had no idea. Uh, I just figured that, uh, that all of Jesus' family were saved. I just figured they were all believers. Uh, but the Bible tells us contrary to that. John chapter 7 in your Bibles. And look, if you will, at verse number 2, John 7, verse 2. The Bible says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him. This is his brothers right here. His brethren therefore said unto him, unto Jesus, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. Uh, and, and in other words, his brothers are saying this. Listen, why don't you, if you're what you say you are, why don't you make it public? That's what they're saying. Uh, verse number four, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he, he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Look at verse five, verse five. For neither did his brethren believe in him. They did not believe he was who he said he was. Now, church, I'm going to tell you something. That's pretty significant. That's pretty significant. They sat across the table from him. They possibly slept in the same bed he slept in. They ate the same food. They had the same mother, the same, of course, their father, his stepfather. They lived in the same house under the same roof, and yet they did not know Christ as Savior. Now, even that teaches us a great truth. You know what the truth is? Salvation is more than an intellectual knowledge. You may be here this morning and say, preacher, yeah, I'm good for heaven. I'm good for heaven because I know all about Jesus and I went to college and I took this religious course and, and then I went ahead and I took a, a follow-up religious course and they taught us all about Jesus and they taught us about, you know, the Holy Land and they taught us about Israel and, uh, you know, and the geographic part of Israel and I know where Jesus traveled and I know where he went and I, and I know some things about him and I'm just telling you this morning that you can know all about him, you can know about him and not know him. You can have an intellectual knowledge of the Savior and be lost in your sin and on your way to hell. That's exactly what's going on here in John chapter 7. He had brothers and sisters who lived with him, and yet they did not believe in him. 
In fact, our Bible tells us, and I'm just giving you the references. We're not going to all these places. But in Mark chapter 6, the Bible says that his siblings lived in a place of unbelief. They lived in a state of denial. And so his own brothers and sisters did not believe he was who he said he was. Now, wait a minute now. Mary, his mother, on the other hand, knew exactly who Jesus was. She was his son, the son of her womb, that the Holy Ghost of God implanted there miraculously, supernaturally. And so, yes, he was the son of her womb, but she also knew, knew this. He was the son of God. And Mary knew something about the Lord. She knew that she gave him his first birth, but she knew he gave her her second birth. And so Mary was a believer. She embraced that he was the son of God. Now, uh, when, I, when, when, when we establish that, when we establish that here in John chapter 19, we learn, I believe we learn two lessons uh, that are incredibly important. Lesson number one is this. Because they were unbelievers, his siblings, they had a completely different set of priorities. Because they were unbelievers, they had a completely different set of priorities. You know what that means? Had the Lord Jesus Christ said to James or Joseph, now, fellas, I'm passing off the scene. You make sure you take care of mom. Totally different set of priorities. You know why? Because Mary was a believer. James was not. Mary was a believer. Joseph was not. In fact, did you know that they believed he was not only not who he said he was, but they believed he was a blasphemer. Uh, here's this brother of theirs that's hanging on the cross, and they don't really, at this point at least, they don't really believe who he is. And so there's a, a totally different set of priorities. Had the Lord Jesus Christ put Mary back into the care of unbelieving siblings, it would have been a very unhealthy relationship or a very unhealthy place for her spiritually. Did you know that the unbelieving crowd can have an effect on your spiritual health? That's why the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Hey, parents, can I just give you a little bit? Can I just give you a little bit of helpful, friendly, loving advice? If you have kids that are dating age or courtship age, and, uh, and, and, and they, you know, they get infatuated with somebody or get interested in somebody, the very first question you better ask is this, are they saved? Are they Christians? You not, and they not ask them necessarily where do they work or who their mom and dad are or where they live at. What you better ask is, are they born again? Are they born again? Why? Because when you get yoked up with unbelievers, I'm telling you, it can harm, it can hinder, it can hurt, it can distract from your spiritual life. And the Lord Jesus Christ knows that. He's got brothers and sisters, by the way, that he loves, and yet they don't believe in him. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, right there at the point of death, he says, John, behold thy mother. I want you to care for mom. I want you to take her under your care. I want you to make sure that you meet her needs. And John said, yes, Lord, I'll do that. He did not entrust his own mother to the care of his siblings. Why? Because they were lost. And priorities were completely, completely different. But there's another lesson. Now, church, hang in there with me. Don't get mad at me. It's either here or it's not here. Lesson number two we learned from this is this, that Jesus gave priority to spiritual family versus physical family. Now, you see if you can read that any other way. Jesus gave priority to spiritual family versus physical family. John was not his physical family. John was his spiritual family. James was physical. Joseph was physical. He had some sisters who were physical. John was, was one of his disciples, but not blood kin. And yet we find here in John chapter 19 that Jesus gave priority to spiritual rather than physical are you following me? Now, I want to encourage you to love your physical family. Saved and lost. Love them. Man, just love them, love them, love them. You're, you'll, you'll, you'll definitely never hear this preacher encourage you not to love your family. I want you to love your family. If they're born again, love them. If they're lost, love them. 
But, but I believe we're learning a lesson here. Uh, we should love our physical family, but the family of God should be given very, very high priority. Amen. Listen, did you know we should never allow physical family to hold us back from dedicating our lives to Jesus? Amen. Come on now. Amen. Boy, when it gets practical, it gets real, don't it? We should never allow our physical family to hold us back from dedicating our lives to Christ. Now, take your Bibles this morning, if you will, and turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, and look, if you will, at verse number 29. And may I remind you that this is our Lord speaking here. Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 29. Hang in there with me, church. Uh, let the Lord speak to your heart this morning. Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 29. And I'm going to go ahead and read while you're finding your way there. Matthew 19 verse 29. Jesus said it like this. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Now, the implication there is this, that there are going to be times when you, when you follow Jesus and when you serve Jesus, there are going to be times when you're going to have to forsake lands and you're going to have to forsake houses, but there are going to be times when you're even going to have to forsake family because you're dedicated to Jesus. Say, preach, I don't like the way this is going. Well, you know what? I didn't write the mail. I just deliver it. Now, same book, Matthew chapter uh, 10, turn back nine chapters. Look at Matthew chapter 10, also interesting that this is our Lord speaking again. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Now, this is not politically correct what I'm giving you right now. And this is definitely not politically correct what, you, what Jesus is teaching. Look at Matthew 10, verse 34. Jesus said, think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Look at verse 37, Calvary. He said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, we're learning a great truth here. And that's this, that Jesus is the most important thing in our life. That's what we're learning, that our Savior, our Lord, by the way, who had perfect knowledge, perfect wisdom, our Lord chose spiritual over physical and said, Mama, I don't want you going home to James. I don't want you, not, not, not right now at least. I don't want you going home to these others. I want you to go with John. John's going to take care of you. And the Lord Jesus Christ chose spiritual over physical physical. Now, uh, I hope it never comes to this at all, but if you're here this morning and you have family members who try to hold you back from serving Jesus, or maybe you're here this morning and you have family members and they say, you know what, you're just getting way, way, way too zealous about this Jesus stuff. And, and uh, you know, I was okay with you going occasionally on Sunday morning, but now you're going back on Sunday night and, and now you're going back on Wednesday night and, and now you're giving, you know, giving money in the offerings and now you're wanting to get in the ministry and now you're teaching a Sunday school class and, and now you're doing all these things and you're just getting way way too zealous about this thing of serving Jesus. Listen, you may need to do this nicely, and you definitely need to do it Christ-like, but I'm just telling you that when it comes between family and it comes between the Savior, the Savior is the one that you ought to choose every time. We choose spiritual versus physical. A lady had went to a revival, man, gotten, just got born again. I mean, just born again. And the Spirit of God began to change her life. And I'm going to be honest with you. She, after she got saved, she became a much better wife. Much better. Man, just loving her husband like she never had. She'd get up, fix his meals, make sure he was absolutely cared for. But she loved Jesus. Man, she loved the Lord. And you could tell it. It wasn't a secret. She had a glow. But you know what happens? When you really get serious about serving the Lord, you know what happens? It provides conviction to other family members. Why do you think they don't want you to come back on Sunday night? You ever thought about that? Why, why do you think that they don't necessarily want you to be faithful to revival? You mean to tell me all oh, it's seven days straight? No, 14. <laughs> you mean to tell me you all oh, went to church every single night? Every night? I mean every night. 
You mean to tell me you're going back tonight? You mean to tell me you're going to that revival? You mean to tell me you're going to that youth conference? You mean to tell me you're sending your kids to that, that, that youth rally? Yeah, we are. Uh, uh, now, wait a minute. Now, when you, when you really, oh, this is, you know what? Yeah, man, yeah. Hallelujah. When you really, really get serious about serving Jesus, it provides conviction. And this lady just loved Jesus, just loved the Lord. But her husband was getting under conviction bad. She got up one morning, Sunday morning, she got up early. She prepared his breakfast. It was a breakfast fit for a king. And uh, she, uh, she went in. She got dressed for church. She came out and uh, gave him a hug and a kiss, got her Bible, was getting ready to walk out the door. And he said, woman, you're not going to church today. And she said, do what, honey? He said, you're not going to church today. And she said, now, sweetheart, she said, I love you with all my heart. And she said, since I've come to know the Lord, He's caused me to love you more than I've ever loved you. I mean, I want to be the wife that God wants me to be. I want to meet your every need. I, I, I want to take care of you. I want to be here for you and support you. But, sweetheart, you know that Jesus saved me, and you know I love the Lord. And he said, I don't care about any of that. I'm just telling you, you're not going to church today. She did her best to try to, to, try to convince him. And, I mean, listen, just crazy stuff, just crazy. He reaches in the drawer, pulls out a revolver out of the drawer, and points a loaded revolver at his wife. And said, I told you, you're not going to church today. And about that time, she got a holy boldness. And she looked back at him and that barrel, that gun, and she said, here's the thing. She said, if you shoot me now, I'm going to heaven. And if you don't, I'm going to church. And grabbed her Bible and went to the house of God. You know what that lady decided to do? She, de she decided to choose spiritual over physical. Let me give you something else. Why did Jesus not entrust Mary to his siblings? Number one, because they were unbelievers. But look at this church. Number two, you know what I really believe? Number two, I believe it's because Jesus' siblings battled with bitterness. I believe that. Now you say, preacher, why would they have battled with bitterness? Well, think about this. And I don't know that I ever, ever really gave this a lot of thought. Did you know that Jesus must have been treated differently by his parents? And it's not that they meant to. And I don't believe that Joseph and Mary, I believe they were cream of the crop. I believe they were chosen, ordained by God. I believe that they were just the best of the best. And so it wasn't that Joseph and Mary had a respect to persons but think about this. How would you like to be the parents of the Son of God? Now, I don't know everything about James, but I can guarantee you this. There were times when James smarted off. You know why? Because James was human. He was a sinner. I don't know everything there is about Joseph, but I can pretty much guarantee you this. There were times when Joseph got in trouble. I mean, does that make sense? You know why? He was human, and he was a sinner. He had a sinful nature. I don't know anything about sisters. Yes, I do know something about sisters. Yes, I do know something about sisters. I don't know anything about those sisters. I know things about sisters, and I'm telling you, they are sinners. I'm telling you, they're sinners. <laughs> now, thankfully, none of them are here this morning. <laughs> Amen. And uh, uh, listen, I'm just telling you, he had siblings that were sinners, you know what? They had to be rebuked by Joseph and Mary. There were times when Joseph and Mary said, hey, straighten up. James, sit up. Joseph, we don't act like that in this house. You get up here to the table whether you want to or not. You, know, you see where I'm going? There were times when they got up and said, mom, I don't want to go to school today. I don't care if you want to go or not. You're going. Get out there and catch that camel right now. I mean, right now. <laughs> and You're going. And so there were times, no doubt there were times when those sisters had to be disciplined. There were times when, when, uh, when those brothers had to be chastened. Never Jesus. He never smarted off to his mom and dad once. When Joseph and Mary caught Joseph in a lie and said, Joseph, you know that's not true. Be honest. I made it up. That never happened to Jesus. 
He never told a lie, never said a bad word. He never took something he shouldn't have taken. He never gave Joseph and Mary any reason to chasten them, to him, to, to, to spank him or chasten him. And so you, you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ must have been treated differently by his parents, but I'll tell you something else. Why would there have been bitterness, preacher? Next is this, Christ placed a high priority on the family of God. Now that goes back a little bit to what we just talked about, but I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter 12 in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 12, and uh, we're gonna bring this to a close. I know we're getting close on time, but uh, hang in there. Hang in there just for a few more moments here. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 46. I believe that Jesus Christ did not entrust mama to those siblings because there was some bitterness. They were unbelievers and there was some bitterness that was there in their life. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Look at verse 47. The Bible says, then one said unto him, behold, I want you to be aware. I want you to know. Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. <laughs> Don't you know, especially if you're lost, if you're an unbeliever and you're living in the flesh, don't you know that ticked them off? They felt like they had a special inroad. He's our brother. People are all around him, and so they come and they say, hey, would you, you know, would you go in there and please tell him we're here? His mother and his brothers are here. And Jesus said, this is my mother and this is my brothers. And man, it ticked them off. And so Christ placed a high priority on the family of God, but there's something else, church. Why would there have been bitterness? How about this? Next is this. Christ left his family to begin his earthly ministry. Remember that? Did you know back in this day and time that would have been considered countercultural? Did you know the eldest was expected to care for the mother and the family? We believe that Joseph, uh, Joseph has passed off the scene. He's, he's died by now. And yet Jesus, well, I hope, I hope you can, I'm, I'm trying to give you a lot. I hope you can get this. And yet Jesus, because he knows why he's here, he leaves his family to begin his earthly ministry. Now we're done, but listen to this. Jesus is making a very clear statement here, and the, and the statement is this. The priority of life is serving God. Amen. Not mama. Not family. Boy, this is good. Mm -mm. Yum, yum. Man, I'm getting this if nobody else is. That's what he's saying. You know what? You know what Jesus is teaching us through all this? God comes first. Amen. Nothing comes before the will of God. Nothing. I mean, I love that little lady. She brought me into this world. I love that little lady like my life. I love her. John, take care of her. I love her. But she's not why I'm here. I love those brothers and sisters that I have, although they're unbelievers, but they're not the reason I'm here. I love these people that I'm serving. They're not the reason I'm here. I'm here to bring glory to God. I'm here to serve the Lord. I'm here to do ministry. I'm here to put God first. Man, if we can ever get to that place in our life and realize that's why you're here today, not for pleasure, not for the big home, not for a nice car, not for another boat. You're here to make a difference for the kingdom of God. That's why you're here. And if we could ever get to that place, boy, it would change our life. Don't you think that's why the Lord said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you? Don't you think that's why the preacher said in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole matter duty of man. Why did Jesus not entrust Mary to his siblings? 
Number one, they didn't believe. And number two, it was bitterness. By the way, bitterness will keep you from accomplishing the will of God. If you're here this morning and there's something, anything, doesn't have to be anything to do with this church. Something in your family, in your marriage, in, in your, your job, whatever it may be. If there's bitterness harbored in your heart, you know what's going to happen? It's going to hinder it's going to hinder what you do for Jesus. Now, let's end this on a great note. Let's end this on a positive note. We know according to Scripture, John chapter 7, that Jesus' siblings were unbelievers, but not forever. You see, our Bible also tells us this, that there was a time that his siblings came to realize who he really was. And uh, that's right. In fact, let's see. Let me see if I can point you to a place here real quickly. How about, um, how about Acts chapter 1? Turn over there and we're done. It's 1234. Wheels are on the runway. We're about to say the prayer. Look at Acts chapter 1 in your Bibles. I could take you to several other places, but Acts chapter 1, verse 13. Now, Christ has died. He, he's died. He's, he has, um, he, he's risen again. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse number 13. And when they, the disciples, when they were coming in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, and James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. Look at verse 14. These, the disciples, the apostles, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. Oh man, look at the last line. And... Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. They were unbelievers. Listen, church, church you can close your Bibles. It's the last place, last place I'm going to take you. They were unbelievers all the way to the cross. He's hanging on the cross, and they're thinking, what a What a failure. I mean, all the stuff he preached, all the stuff he taught. I mean, he's talking about setting up a kingdom, and now he's got nails in his hands and nails in his feet. I mean, look at him. What a disgrace. What a blasphemer. And yet they couldn't help but, they couldn't help but remember all those days they grew up with him. He never cursed like they did. He never took anything that wasn't his. He never sassed mom and dad like they sassed mom and dad. He never disobeyed, never cheated. And they got to thinking about that. Jesus dies on the cross. They take him off the cross. Come on now, good neighbor. They put him in a grave. And the Bible tells us that Jesus stayed in that grave three days and three nights and he came out. Amen? Amen. And he didn't just come out, but our Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that when he came out, he showed himself to some people. <laughs> you know who one of those people were? His brother. His brethren, and all of a sudden, that same guy that's hanging on the cross now is in his glorified body, and he appears to them, and they're thinking, you know what? Now they be, their mind begins to go back, and they think of all those days when he was perfect, and sometimes it made them sick. You're Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. Come on, let's go get in a little trouble. Jesus would never do that. They thought about all those times when they disrespected mom and dad, he respected them. When they disobeyed mom and dad, he obeyed them. When they said wrong things, he never did. When they looked at wrong things, he never did. When they went wrong places, he never did. And their mind begins to go back and they're thinking, man, I remember all those days and days and days when we did wrong and we did wrong and we did wrong, but he never did, he never did. And, and now, on top of all that, guess what? He appears as a risen resurrected Savior and his siblings say, wow, he really is who he said he was. <laughs> Did you know that James, the brother of Jesus, became one of the great leaders in the church of Jerusalem? By the way, did you know that two of Jesus' brothers wrote two of your New Testament books? They went on to be greatly used of God. Now, you say, all right, okay, okay, preacher, 
All right, I get that, but you know, what's your, what, what's your point? L- listen to this. I want to conclude with this. If you're here this morning and you have lost family members, don't get discouraged. You keep living that consistent Christian life in front of them and let your light shine and show them the love of Jesus Christ. And you say, preacher, it's been 20 years. My brother's lost I've been saved for 20 years. I've been living for the Lord for 20 years. He never asked to come to Christ. You keep living for the Lord. Keep talking right. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep reading your Bible. Keep spending time in prayer. Keep, uh, stay faithful to church. And, and listen, whatever you do, let your light shine. Why? Because there is a very good likelihood that you might be the key to them coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Will you bow your heads with us this morning? Father, Wow. Wow. What a truth. Lord, how did I miss that all these years? Thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us some things this morning that, Lord, that the number one priority in life is the kingdom of God. There is nothing else as important. No money, no home, no career, no popularity, No people that is more important than us dedicating our life to the gospel and to serving our King of kings and our Lord of lords. Father, I pray today that you would work in somebody's heart and today they would say, Lord, I am dedicating my life to you. It's not gonna be convenient, but today I'm selling out for the cause of Christ. Lord, you got me. Lock, stock, and barrel, you got me. Just show me what you want me to do, where you want me to go. God, I'm serving Jesus. And if it's popular with others, I'm serving Jesus. But if it's not popular with others, I'm serving Jesus. And then, Lord, I pray that you'd help those that have lost family members. God, may they be encouraged today and realize that if they'll keep letting their light shine, Lord, that there's a good opportunity that their family is going to come to Christ. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Just a question or two. How many are here this morning? Come on now, I want you to be really, really honest with the pastor. And I'm not going to come back and try to drag you down an aisle or anything like that. But I sure want to pray for you. And I'll not pray for you by name, but the Lord will know who you are. How many are here in this room this morning and you would say, Pastor, Brother Pope, Preacher, if I died today, if I died today, I am not sure that I would make it to heaven. And Preacher, I care enough to slip up my hand and let you pray for me. Is there one like that anywhere right now? Right now, you'd slip your hand up and just say, Pastor, remember me. If I died, I'm not sure of heaven. Would you remember me? Right now, just slip your hand up. Would you raise it? And just let me pray for you. Right now, raise it high now so I don't miss you. Anybody at all like that here today? Anybody at all? As far as I could tell, I didn't see any hands. So here's the next question. Hey, Christian. Are you totally, absolutely, completely sold out to Jesus? I mean, he gets first priority in everything. Is he number one? Absolutely number one. If that's not the case, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to make a move. I want you just to, to make your way down to this altar today and just get down here and say, Lord, today's the day. You're number one. You are number one in my life and then if you're here this morning and pastor I've got some family members that I care very deeply about but they're lost they don't know Christ and I'm so burdened about them oh I want them to be saved I want them to be saved if that's you in just a moment I'm going to ask you to come and folks are already coming let's just go ahead and stand right now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed father I pray you'll have your way in this invitation Now, Lord, I know this is not the norm. This is not what's being preached today in a lot of places. This is not politically correct. 
God, I pray today that you'd help us to sell out. Oh, God. Help us to, to come today and say, Lord, you got me. I'm giving my all. I'm selling out. I yield myself just like John did. I yield myself. Lord, whatever you want, whatever you want. Lord, I pray today that you'd have your way. I'm going to ask our personal workers, if they're not already in the altar, if they'll make their way to the altars this morning. And if you're here this morning and you say, Brother Pope, I need to be saved. Listen, why don't you come and we have somebody in the altar up here with a Bible in their hand. And we're not going to embarrass you. We'd just like to take a Bible and show you how you can know that you're going to heaven when you die, okay? And so while we pause, while we pause just a moment, will you come? Will you come? There's somebody here this morning, God's speaking to your heart. Oh, my. I need to just let the Lord have his way. Let go. Let God. If that's you, would you come? Hey, young person, how about you? Hey, teenager, young adult, I wonder if we got any young adults in this room who would say, you know what, Lord, you've got me. This is it. I'm serving you the rest of my days. I'm serving you. You're priority number one. Anybody else? Amen. 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 Anybody else? So our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. And God, we thank you for what you're doing in the altars. Thank you for what you're doing in the seats. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you might bring the increase from it all. Lord, I pray that we'll, that we'll make you number one in our life. The will of God. There's nothing else more important than the will of God. Father, help us today, I pray. Lord, solidify these decisions on the altars, I pray. And we pray that our Savior would receive praise and glory from it all. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, are getting some help. We're going to sing in just a minute, okay? Anybody else while we wait? Lord, again, we thank you. Thank you for giving us your precious Holy Spirit. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for being so faithful to pass by our way so many times. And God, thank you that even right now you're, you're dealing in some hearts. Oh, God, I pray that you would work. And Lord, it could be that you're prolonging this invitation because there's somebody else who needs to make a move or somebody else needs to make a decision. So, Father, right now I pray that you'd work. I pray you'd give courage, give faith. And Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you do. You can look up this way, church. Folks are still getting some help today. We're going to sing this little chorus. We haven't sang this in a little while, but it's a great one. And it just simply says, I can trust Jesus. Somebody says, Preacher, what would happen if I totally sell out to Jesus? What will happen? I can't guarantee you what's going to happen, but I can guarantee you this, that you can trust Jesus, amen? And he'll take mighty good care of you. I can promise you that. We're going to sing this together. You sing it up. If you still need to come, the altars are open. You come while we wait, all right? Sing it, church. I can trust
aisle. And if you need to sit, that's not a problem. You're not disrespectful if you need to take a seat. That's okay. But you know, we never want to rush an invitation while the Spirit of God is working. If you're watching the live stream this, uh, this afternoon, we're so glad to have you tuning in. There's a number on the bottom of your screen right now, 704-327-5662. And we have some of our prayer helpline workers that are waiting right beside the phone right now. And they would love to take your call. We would love nothing more than to share Christ with you and how you can know him as Savior. And so I hope you'll call. And if we can pray with you, maybe you're watching the broadcast today and you feel like you're at the end of your rope. And you say, Pastor, I am saved, but I'm so discouraged. Listen, if you'll call that number on your screen, we'll pray with you and we'll believe God with you. I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll do that right now. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Well, aren't you glad to see the Lord work? Amen. Amen. May we never, never, never get tired of that. Never get tired of that. We thank the Lord for that. Uh, good response today. A lot going on in the altar. And um, Taylor, raise your hand right down here. This is Taylor Johnson. And uh, Taylor came by our house this week, and she wanted to tell us something. And so as she came by, and um, anyway, what she wanted to tell us was that she got saved this week. Amen. And we rejoice with that. Amen. 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 And so God willing, we're going to baptize tonight. We're going to baptize several, but Taylor's going to be one of those that we're going to baptize tonight in the service. And so anyway, you remember her. That's good, Taylor. We're glad for you. That's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Listen, hope you have a great afternoon, and we'll look forward to seeing you back in the Lord's house. By the way, incidentally, I'm going to teach tonight on what the Bible has to say about baptism, okay? Now, you say, that's not important. Oh, man. Yes, it is very important. And uh, it's very important that you hear this message, very specific. And I'm not just teaching this because we're getting back, we're having some baptisms tonight, but there's a specific reason, and I'll go into that later tonight. But I hope you won't miss tonight, whatever you do. So bring your Bibles and get ready to take a note or two and we'll look forward to all the Lord is going to do. Amen. Preacher, would you come? And I'll have you dismiss us in prayer. Listen, go away blessed. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you tonight at 6 p.m. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in the house of the Lord today. What a blessing it is to be able to come and worship and to hear the word of God. And I pray now that you'd take us and use us throughout the remainder of this day. God, help us find ourselves faithfully back here this evening that we may hear from thee and hear from thy word. May your will be done in Christ's name, and for his sake we pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you for joining us today. We consider it an honor to serve you, and our prayer is that the service was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. If you were impacted today by the preaching of God's word, we encourage you to respond. If we can pray with you, or if you would like to make a decision today for Christ, please call us here at 704-327-5662. We have people waiting right now on the lines prepared to help you. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to welcome you again soon. Have a wonderful week.